Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Roni Setton for today's CIC um, series lecture. Roni obtained a dual, dual degree in neuroscience and business um, at the Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. Um, she then completed her master's in developmental psychology at Cornell University in New York um, with a particular focus on human neuroscience. Um, so she was studying the neural underpinnings of decision-making using fMRI. Currently, she's a final year PhD candidate in Nathan Sprengs lab at the MNI. Um, and her main research interests center on uh, studying functional brain changes in memory and aging with a specific interest in the role of semantic memory and semantic cognition in older age. Um, but today specifically, she'll be presenting some of her PhD work examining functional brain changes in healthy ageing um, using an array of recently developed fMRI techniques. And just regards to questions today, um, as usual, you can post questions in the chat. Um, Roni's requested that we um, save the questions for two points during our um, during. The course of her talk so you're welcome to write them as we go but I will read them kind of at the halfway point and then um, at the end. All right so over to you Roni. Awesome thanks Cherie, thanks Malar, thank you guys for having me today. Um, I'm super excited to share this pretty fresh work that has been a couple of years in the making now um, and I really have to thank uh, a fellow grad student of mine, Leticia Mulambo Ichilobo. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years together and um, yeah, let's take it away. So just an overview of where I'll be going. So I'll start with, you know, defining what it is I'm talking about and a little bit of the basics of functional MRI and functional connectivity and some challenges that uh, the field faces, and then some improvements that we then apply to the study of healthy aging. And I'll go through each of um, the components of the study, and then I'll briefly touch on future directions towards the end. All right, so um, functional MRI and the measurement of brain activity really enables us to measure bold signal in any given region over time. So here shown primary somatomotor, uh, primary somatomotor cortex um, with the bold signal shown over time here. And functional connectivity is really the coherence of bold signal among two regions. So here shown periaqueductal gray. And the more, sig more similar the signal over time, the stronger the correlation or the functional connection is assumed to be. And so this can be done while individuals are performing some task in an MRI scanner, but it can also be done at rest. And then networks of coherent bold signal fluctuations can then be identified shown in these panels in the volume or projected on the surface down here, labeled with their functional network labels. And networks at rest are really thought to reflect inherent identifiable properties of the human connectome. And while we can identify these networks pretty reliably across people, we can also detect subtle but likely meaningful differences among individuals across groups like in pathology uh, or across development, which is really the focus of this talk. And so from these discoveries, we've seen an immense amount of progress uh, with respect to how we can study resting state functional connectivity and brain networks, but challenges remain. The first of which can be attributed to scanning protocols. So particularly with single echo acquisitions, there's a problem with low signal to noise in some regions, especially at air tissue interfaces like the anterior and medial temporal lobes and the orbital frontal cortex. And of course, this can be exacerbated by an aging brain that incurs atrophy in these regions. The second challenge is that functional MRI data, especially resting state data, is pretty noisy. And a lot of denoising needs to happen on pretty poorly understood sources of noise, and this can compromise statistical inference. This is too exacerbated by the aging brain because older adults tend to move more in the scanner, which will inherently or uh, consequently lead to more noise. 
And so what's usually done to denoise the data is the regression of head motion parameters and their derivatives, usually linear, linearly, um, as well as regression of other nuisance uh, variables such as white matter, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, et cetera. And then sometimes even time points are completely removed from the data. A particularly controversial nuisance, vari nuisance variable is uh, the global signal. And global signal is often regressed from uh, fMRI data uh, to take care of noise, but this might be removing biologically relevant neural signal and may even distort group differences, especially if the global signal is different across groups. And so with one potential solution to this is multi-echo acquisitions. So with single echo acquisitions, data is usually obtained at one echo time or TE within a time point or TR. And usually that results in one time series per voxel. With multi-echo acquisitions, data is obtained at multiple TEs within a single TR. So here before and after a traditional single echo acquisition. And it's essentially collecting more information and then you end up with multiple time series per voxel. And the benefit is, then you, is that then you can optimally combine echo times for better TSNR or a better signal to noise. Because each region of the brain has an optimal TE at which peak bold signal can be measured. So collecting multiple TEs and combining them in a weighted average helps us to capture bold signal at the optimal time for every voxel. But crucially, measured bold signal should change with TE because of the transverse relaxation after an excitation pulse. Without going into many more details, this is essentially the TE dependence model of bold signal. And so we can actually denoise fMRI data by modeling neuronal signal, which is TE dependent, separately from noise, which is TE independent. And this type of denoising has been found to effectively re remove the influence of motion. So if we take, for example, two subjects who have different degrees of motion, um, uh, with ME with multi echo data. So, subject one has lower amount of motion with some skin or drift. Subject two has higher motion, which is more jerky. We're looking at the, the, the raw motion traces over time uh, on the top panel. And then the second panel is showing how motion changes from one time point to the other. And then we can really see where the jerky, spiky movement is. Then if we look at the change in signal intensity, this too lets us look at how bold signal changes from one time point to the other. And this is interesting to look at or crucial to look at in, um, in conjunction with uh, frame-wise displacement or motion by time point, because then you can really identify how, whether motion has infiltrated the bold signal measurement. And when these two are highly corresponding, that means there's motion in your data. And so the black, the black trace is the raw, the raw change in bold signal over time. Um, and the yellow trace is after traditional motion regression, linear motion regression. And what we can see is that there's some improvement in the subject with low motion, but there's really not much of an improvement in a subject with high motion. And this isn't desirable. It, it means that motion is still affecting the bold signal. Now, if we apply multi-echo denoising, what we can see is that now the signal that's been modeled as noise is following the raw trace. And the signal that's been modeled as bold is no longer corresponding to um, the, the, the frame-wise displacement or the motion over time. And this is super desirable to remove the explicit impact of noise uh, impact of motion from the data. And this is true in both low motion and high motion subjects, which is really crucial because then you don't have to throw away data uh, from high motion subjects. So in some multi-echo acquisitions means more data and simple principle and effective denoising. 
Another challenge is how we define the region from which we extract bold signal and measure functional connectivity. Functional regions change across tasks, across parcellations, across individuals, across the lifespan. And in the current context, how do we know that we're extracting signal from the same region in participants from different cohorts? So typically, a common atlas is used, which is created with young adult data. This is problematic when, especially when you're mapping older adult anatomy to an atlas created with young adult data. But now there are methods where we can use a parcellation scheme that's tailored to an individual based on their resting state functional connectivity data. And this better approximates individuals' functional regions, as we can see here in three different subjects. And I'll draw your attention to this red-green boundary. It slightly changes between subjects. And doing so has been shown to improve predict predictions with behavior. A final challenge is that um, resting state data is often done, especially in the aging literature, is done at a course level of analysis. Much of the existing work includes global signal regression, which um, in order to reduce the impact of noise, which sadly limits the range of analysis because it shifts the distribution of functional connectivity values and limits the interpretation. Uh, especially in the aging literature as well, analyses are often targeted to certain networks of interest, which again limits the range of analysis. So with multi-echo fMRI and denoising, we can use the full range of connections to identify both large-scale patterns across the whole brain, and we can narrow in on regional connectivity to look at pairwise connections. So we wanted to apply all three of these improvements to the study of healthy aging. So I'll briefly go over this. This is a, a huge oversimplification, but largely what we know in healthy aging boils down to the following. There's lower connectivity within networks and greater connectivity between networks with age across the lifespan. And usually this is associated with worse performance. The most consistent finding has been within the default network. And the default network is associated with episodic memory, self-referential processing, and a host of other internally driven stimuli. And less connectivity has been found within the network, whereas more connectivity has been found with executive control networks. Executive control networks, on the other hand, are usually associated with externally driven stimuli. So this is a noteworthy finding, given that these networks subserving internal and external attention are often, but not always, anti-correlated, as shown here. So more connectivity between these networks with age implies that they're less distinct. So if we apply these three solutions to healthy aging, what do we find? Do we confirm what we already know? Do we find something new? Can we redefine any metrics? So we collected 20 minutes of multi-echo resting state data from 181 younger adults and 120 older adults. And we used multi-echo fMRI for processing and denoising to separate bold-like signal and non-bold-like signal into separate components. We then implemented an individualized parcellation scheme. And then also, all participants underwent a pretty extensive cognitive battery. And so be because we do uh, look at associations with cognition, I'll first give you some descriptives about the cognitive, um, the cognitive results. So as, as expected, younger adults performed better in domains of episodic memory, executive function, and processing speed, and older adults performed better in, domain, in the domain of semantic memory. So our first step was to really look at how multi-echo processing and denoising fundamentally alters something we're calling, calling bold dimensionality. From the denoising, each individual ended up with a different number of bold-like components. And each bold-like component is comprised of regions that show a similar, um, similar trajectory of bold signal over time, essentially serving as a network. And this is determined at the subject level, as opposed to the group level where networks are usually identified. 
And so then we can think about bold dimensionality as a proxy for network integration. So if bold dimensionality is, is plotted as a function of age, and this is from a previous uh, publication, we can see that in this, in this cohort spanning from adolescence to about middle adulthood, uh, bold dimensionality decreases with age in accordance with a power function. And here we're looking at how this continues into older age. So in our sample, we found plotting the distributions only of uh, bold dimensionality, older adults had lower bold signal dimensionality than younger adults. But then if we plot that as a function of age and then include the data from the previous slide, we do see that bold signal dimensionality into older adulthood continues to decrease in accordance with a power function. And this coincides with functional and structural work shown in younger adulthood, adolescence and younger adulthood, that there is this increase of long range connections that's often uh, prefrontal to transmodal connections that reflect connections of anatomical and functional hubs helping to develop um, spatially distributed but intrinsically coherent functional networks. So there's more integration at this time, uh, this time period, but it's in a way that refines network structure leading to more modular or segregated network. But then this decrease continues past that age. And that matches prior work showing that there's this there's more integration across regions and less differentiated networks in older age. There's um, with uh, in sorry with uh, with uh, a, a, as we get older, there's this linear uh, decrease of um, modularity, and then we can also identify fewer networks uh, in older adults as compared to younger adults. So shown here, the default mode and frontal parietal control regions are merging as compared to younger adults when they're much more separable. So then when we relate this, this measure of bold dimensionality to cognition, in young adults, we're really not seeing any relationship. But in older adults only, lower dimensionality is associated with lower episodic memory, suggesting that dimensionality in older adulthood may impart some benefit on cognition. But then we looked across our full sample controlling for age to examine how bold dimensionality impacts cognition independent of age-related effects. And we found that lower dimensionality was related, was related to lower semantic memory, suggesting that dimensionality may be beneficial for crystallized cognition. We also found that lower dimensionality was related to higher executive function which suggests that integration may be conducive to more complex functions. But notably, neither of these were present in either group alone. And when we're talking about bold dimensionality, we're still talking about a pretty global nonspecific metric. So lower dimensionality during development may refine networks to support cognition. But we also know from previous work in the aging literature that integration into older age is associated with worse cognition. So lower dimensionality may only be beneficial until a certain point. And then as I introduce our functional connectivity work, we'll see how functional connectivity differentially impacts cognition within each age group. So I'll pause here uh, after talking about bold dimensionality and see if there are any questions just to make sure people are following along. Okay, so we have one question from Randy McIntosh. He's asked um, how dimensionality is estimated. So uh, dimensionality is estimated from multi-echo processing. So by modeling signal versus noise, we're just looking at what was modeled as signal. And then for each person, we get components that are labeled as signal and components that are labeled as noise. So it's just the components labeled as signal. Okay. Um, and a follow-up to that, he's commented that these results seem to differ from the EEG literature. Hmm. 
I'm not sure if that's something you're familiar with or whether Randy, you want to elaborate on those findings. You're welcome to unmute yourself um, yeah. if you would like as well. Yeah, I was going to continue typing and that probably is not. <laughs> um, the main thing, I guess, is that, uh, I mean, I, I measuring dimensionalities can be done a number of different ways, of course. Mm -hmm. so one of the traditional ways, of course, is using some sort of um, dimensionality reduction technique, like a principal component or independent components, and seeing how many components you need to reproduce right. the signal. Right. Um, that's what's been done, for example, in other fMRI work, but also in EEG. Mm -hmm. um, and in EEG work, I think what, what you tend to see is that there's always this U-shaped curve across development. So that dimensionality is actually lower in infants and kids, and then it increases to middle age, mm. and then drops off, or kind of diffuses, actually, in older age, depending on cognitive status. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that could be related to the different time scales or which the data are um, sensitive. So certainly in EEG, you've got a, you know, past your time scale, whereas in fMRI bold, you've got a, you know, a long, depending on, how, again, how you estimate the signal, um, right. you do have a different time step to look at. So just a point, not necessarily a problem, just something to consider, I think. No, that's an interesting point. Definitely worth considering. I'm not really familiar with um, the EEG work, but I wonder if it is just a time scale thing or just a measurement difference. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things in kids, and I don't want to talk too long, but um, their brains tend to be quite uh, deterministic in terms of how they mm. respond. Um, and you see that in young kids, certainly in infants, but so that the dimensionality is reflecting the fact that when they get stimulus, everything is focused on the stimulus. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whereas as you get more differentiation, as you mentioned, you probably get the ability for uh, better information processing, but that would actually lead to a different prediction in terms of dimensionality for infants mm. if you look about deterministic versus stochastic systems. Mm. That's true. That's a good point. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions for Ronnie at this stage? It doesn't sound like it. It's all been very clear so far. So <laughs> you can carry on. Okay, great. So next we'll dive into more direct measures of functional connectivity. So we've taken this bold-like data um, and we've computed functional connectivity matrices. But first, we can characterize patterns of connectivity that are similar across networks. So gradients of functional connectivity have been identified that hierarchically organize patterns of connectivity across the brain. Shown here is a principal gradient separating unimodal from transmodal in warmer colors functional connectivity profiles. And then using gradients, we can test whether large scale patterns of connectivity differ between younger and older adults. So here we identified a principal gradient in both younger and older adults. And then in, in line with previous work, uh, this distinguished between unimodal networks in the cooler colors and transmodal networks in the warmer colors. And when we contrasted older and younger adults, what we found is that bilateral superior parietal lobe has a functional connectivity profile that was more similar to other transmodal networks in older adults. A second gradient was also identified in each group that also matched previous work. This gradient uh, distinguished between unimodal networks, uh, specifically with the visual network in the cooler colors and the somatomotor network in the, more, uh, in the more yellow color, in the warmer colors. But there was no, oh, but there was no group difference here. And so with these results, we saw that gradients are more or less preserved between younger and older adults. But then you can take, uh, gradient one and gradient two and plot points in 2D gradient space. So for each gradient that was identified, each participant has a gradient one score and a gradient two score. And you can plot this like a coordinate in, in 2D gradient space, resulting in something called a manifold. And this tells us how any given region of a network adheres to the connectivity profile of its neighbors. So here we see the manifold for younger adults, and here we see the manifold for older adults. And qualitatively, it looks like the vertices in the older adult manifold are more diffuse, 
where regions of a network are showing less similar connectivity profiles to other regions in that network. And we quantified this metric as something called manifold eccentricity. And indeed, we, we found that older adults have higher manifold eccentricity in, uh, compared to younger adults, suggesting that the connectivity profile of a given region is less consistent and that where that region falls in the hierarchy of functional connectivity is less consistent. And then when we associated that with cognition, we found no association. So this too fits in with previous finding, findings that showed that there was really no difference in the global efficiency or ability of a network to transmit information at the global level between younger and older adults. Likewise, there's no linear relationship across the lifespan um, of global efficiency. So while networks do seem to be more integrated and less distinct, the global organization is more or less preserved. Yet, regions within, that, within networks are showing less similar connectivity profiles as demonstrated by that expanded manifold, which suggests that something may be happening at a more regional level. So let's go into the more regional level. So here we used a partial least squares approach to detect patterns of covariance in different functional connectivity matrices, in our case, younger and older adults. And this multivariate approach can reveal patterns of pairwise connections that diverge between groups. And so here we're organizing and labeling them by network. So if we take the average matrices of our younger and older adults, visually, we can already see that low weighted connections are becoming high uh, positive, low weighted negative connections are becoming, sorry, my cat's running around, uh, are becoming low weighted positive connections. And then if we plot the top 5% of positive connections, we can start to see that networks are becoming a little less differentiated in older adults. And that's, you can see that because they're clustering together more. And I'll direct your attention specifically to the visual network connecting more with the frontal parietal connect, uh, network, for example. But then when we quantitatively compare younger and older adult matrices, one significant pattern emerges. It emerges. And these warm colors highlight patterns expressed more by younger adults, whereas the cooler colors express patterns expressed more by older adults. And what we can see is that there's greater within network connectivity ac almost across the board for younger adults, as well as greater between network connectivity in the default and limbic networks. Whereas for older adults, by and large, what we're seeing is greater between network connectivity. We can then reassign regions to their networks and look at the network connectivity that contributes to this pattern greater than chance. So again, the, the warmer colors are more expressed in younger adults, the blue colors more expressed in older adults and vice versa, or sorry, more red is more expressed in younger adults, less expressed in older adults, blue more expressed in older adults, less expressed in younger adults. So what we see is that older adults are expressing less within network connectivity and less connectivity between limbic, frontal parietal and default networks, and instead are showing much more between network connectivity of the visual and somatomotor systems. You can then extract a brain connectivity score for each participant from this result which reflects the degree to which he or she expresses this connectivity pattern. And so what that would mean is that um, any, any, any score for younger adults would reflect the, the warmer pattern and any score for older adults would reflect the cooler pattern. And when we relate that to cognition with younger adults shown on the top and older adults shown on the bottom, we only find one significant association, and that's with executive function in older adults, such that the more older adults express this blue pattern as exemplified by this network connectivity, the lower their executive function. 
now because uh, one of the most consistent findings in the aging literature is that there's increase between network connectivity, especially of transmodal networks, we did this analysis once again, but only with the default network, frontal par parietal control network, and dorsal attention network, and their constituent, uh, their constituent subnetworks. And so if we, once again, just look at the average matrices for younger and older adults, we can see that again, low weighted negative connections are becoming low weighted positive connections in older adults. If we once again, plot the top 5% of positive connections only, what really stands out is that these nodes in the middle from subnetworks of the default network and frontal parietal control network are really becoming more integrated within this uh, scheme. Note, notably, the, the dorsal attention network, this subnetwork of the dorsal attention network is also becoming more integrated. And in fact, one of the regions within this subnetwork is the superior parietal lobe, which if you recall, showed a more similar connectivity profile to other transmodal regions in older adults. Now, if we once again quantitatively compare younger and older adult matrices, we see this pattern where again, the warmer colors are reflective of a pattern more, more present in younger adults, the cooler colors more present in older adults. And what we see is that again, there's more within network connectivity for younger, uh, more within subnetwork connectivity for younger adults, and more between network connectivity, subnetwork connectivity for older adults. And when we look at the networks that are reliably contributing to this pattern, what we see is that for younger adults, this is again within subnetworks, but for older adults, it's really dorsal attention network um, interconnectivity that's driving this result, as well as uh, interconnectivity between uh, subnetworks of the default network and frontal parietal control network. And if we again extract this brain network score for this result and relate it to cognition, the only association that emerges is for older adults and executive function, such that the more older adults express this blue pattern that's exemplified by this network connectivity pattern, the lower executive function. So it really seems that less within network connectivity, more between network connectivity is a hallmark of neurocognitive aging. And this has been shown before across the whole brain but also within the default network where there's been lower, uh, lower connectivity within the default network, but more connectivity between networks, especially with executive regions. But now this is extending to the rest of the brain and particularly the visual, somatomotor and dorsal attention networks. But this too has been shown before where the visual and somatomotor networks have shown increasing participation with the rest of the brain in older age. Yet participation is pretty nonspecific and these results have never really been interpreted and actually pretty downplayed. Earlier, we saw that globally lower bowl dimensionality or less distinctness between networks contributed to better executive function independent of age. Yet here we showed that with our connectomics assessing regional connectivity that less within network connectivity overall and greater connectivity between these networks um, negatively impacts cognition, specifically uh, in older age. So in sum, multi-echo fMRI seems to increase signal to noise and apply a simplified and principled denoising. It also lets us I use this metric of bold dimensionality as a global measure of network integration at a pretty early level of analysis, which may offer insight into individual differences, group differences, and development. Individualized parcellation really defines individually specific functional regions and allows us to um, more precisely measure functional connectivity for each individual. 
And then multivariate methods can capture both large scale and fine grain differences in the functional connectome. And here we combine all three of these advances to offer a comprehensive high fidelity look at neurocognitive aging. But it is worth mentioning that longitudinal data would be ideal to study brain development and change um, and would strengthen any links to cognition and especially cognitive change. And further improvements to acquisition like multi-band and multi-slice acquisitions will definitely provide more resolution to functional brain imaging. Luckily, multi-echo, multi-band longitudinal data is already being collected at the Douglas with the PREVENT AD study. But that said, multi-echo fMRI, individual parcellations, and multivariate methods all combined are tools for resting state functional connectivity that offer pretty huge improvements to the status quo, uh, perhaps bringing us a little bit closer to ground truth. Uh, with that, I want to thank you guys. I will mention that we have some code available on our GitHub. Otherwise, it's been sprinkled throughout the presentation where appropriate. Um, but I'm happy to direct people to resources if it's of interest. And now I'll take questions. Great. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, we already have a couple of questions in the chat. So Gabrielle is asking, could these large scale differences with age be explained by non-neural confounds such as different vascular properties? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so he's also said um, multi-echo doesn't account for confounds that are mixed into the bold signal. Yeah, so multi-echo data is really good at isolating some noise uh, from signal, but not all noise. So yes, neurovascular coupling is still um, something that needs to be considered um, and should be, we, we need to account for it somehow um, in future work, uh, but we can't necessarily um, isolate it from this data. Right, okay. Um, and we also have a comment from Randy saying that the cross network effects may also be related to network switches. So there's less oh. switching in older adults in general, which would blur the network boundaries. Hmm. Randy, did you want to speak more? Yeah, what do you mean I, I, I actually talking? quite like the way you summed up the talk. And um, I was trying to see whether, so there's been some findings recently when we look at dynamic functional connectivity as opposed to the long time series. Mm -hmm. um, and there's at least two papers that have looked at age effects, one from um, Joanna Cabral, that was published in, I think, Nature, um, and another one that came up more recently from Damien Battaglia. Hmm. Um, and what they found in both situations is that in generally, in general, if you look at dynamic functional connectivity, that there's less switching. <clears throat> um, like, with, with state? like state switching? switching? Between switch, yeah, resting state, which you look at instead of, like, actually Johnny uses LIDA instead of the sliding window, but mm -hmm. um, this, the same outcome in both studies um, is that there's generally less switching in older adults and that the the amount of switching correlates with cognitive status. So um, if you think about switching as reflecting um, a, a transition between integration mm -hmm. and segregation, if the networks are basically more static in aging, you'd have a reduction of dimensionality in general, mm. um, which would actually, actually, actually then link in both your functional connectivity findings, but also your dimensionality results. They would both mm. be consistent with that. Mm. Um, so, and you have, I mean, you could in fact look at that in your data because the, the techniques are very easy to apply to, they're actually built for fMRI data so they can be done um, if you had got a spare time to do the analysis. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we do have a grad student in our lab looking at uh, more dynamic functional connectivity. I'm not sure if he's applying it to, to our aging cohort, but mm, that, that's a yeah, good point. The, the, the codes available from uh, the group in Oxford um, under the general rubric of hidden Markov modeling. Okay. Um, and it is, uh, it runs quite well in, in that lab. Um, we're using it for fMRI as well as EEG data. So it's, and it does show these very nice patterns of um, switching. The one other thing is that actually in Joanna's work, which is kind of cool is that she shows that the actual pattern of switching, the, the trajectory going between networks is, is indicative of cognitive status. So certain patterns actually are more indicated of, in, indicative of poor cognitive status in health oh. element, where others is an indicator of good cognitive status, so. And when you say cognitive status, do you mean more so 
as like MMSE or? No, this is basically using the similar kinds of batteries that you used here. Okay. Um, just general sort of, you know, neuropsych assessments and then memory and things of that sort. And people okay. who had a certain pattern of switching actually show relatively worse cognitive performance in these hmm. tasks than others. So. Thank you. Nice work though. Any other questions for Ronnie? We have plenty of time. So. I do. Can I ask it directly, or is there another one? Before? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Actually, so maybe, maybe I before I. It's more kind of a brainstorming, but maybe I do. So uh, maybe, uh, Randy, I would ask you a question first. So we are, we are also looking at this kind of you know dynamic functional connectivity, and then I'm kind of wondering, do you have an idea of the minimum time of data acquisition that we need to do that? A resting state. Yeah. Uh... Depends on the technique you use for, for estimating the, the dynamics. Um, I think probably minimum would be 10 minutes of resting okay. state. Um, you can probably get some dynamics of, in small, smaller resting state, like five or less. Um, but of course, the problem is that your the stability of the estimation is going to be compromised. Yeah. Um, the thing about the, the hidden Markov approach is that um, it doesn't require you to specify a window. Um, so it estimates the window empirically from the data, which gives you a bit more flexibility in the time series. It still requires a long time series, but it doesn't require you to specify a window length in advance. You can accommodate um, shorter resting state uh, periods uh, with hidden Markov approaches. Great, wonderful, wonderful. Maybe let's uh, continue the discussion offline with the <laughs> sure, <laughs> for sure. Point. So I guess I mean, great talk. I guess that you know my my question to you is a little bit the same as they gave. So you know, what do you think is happening in aging? And then you know, it's kind of not that much related to cognition. So do you think you know? Do you think it's kind of again like he was asked, you know, kind of a vascular process? You know, you think it's it's kind of compensation in some ways, since the cognition seems to be not that much affected. So. What do you think is maybe it's more in one answer, but what do you think it's happening there? Yeah, so it's hard to decouple from, to, from neurovascular coupling, but if we speculate, um, it, this does fall in line with uh, some, some task activation research that shows dedifferentiation. So there seems to be compensation in older age with functional brain activity in prefrontal cortex, but there also seems to be this dedifferentiation in more sensory cortices like fusiform face area and parahippocampal place area, but also primary sensory cortices. So it could be some sort of compensation and dedifferentiation that's happening that's also just manifest in the, the, the resting state networks and not just during task. But again, that we, we don't have that data, but that's kind of what we're thinking at this time. And then, I mean, if there's other, any other question, just uh, stop me, Sherry. But then, and and you know what? So the thing is, we, we looked within the prevent AD. So, uh, but but what would you expect uh, in the prevent AD? What or in other national <laughs> court? What do you what would you expect uh, happening? And then after that, I can tell you uh, a little bit of what we saw. So, what would I expect? That's a good question in terms of the Alzheimer's progression. Um. Yeah, or, you know, just normal aging over time, right? Kind of really like multiple time points and then... I would expect to see something similar, perhaps less drastic um, in, in that longitudinal space. Um, and then perhaps more drastic, you know, with more progressive cognitive impairment. Um, but I'd, I'd be very curious to hear what you're actually finding. So we, so we pretty see, so we see, I mean, maybe someone on the call can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, so we see pretty much actually no change in, not a lot of change in resting state, kind of, you know, flat, yeah. but then going to Gabe question, not exactly the same, but you know, if you're looking at the impact of uh, hypertension, like vascular disease, mm -hmm. um, cholesterol and so on, then yeah. that the one with vascular disease, they do have this uh, kind of little pet pattern that you're seeing cross-sectionally, but then longitudinally. Oh, then there are some studies suggesting that it's really kind of at older age that you start to see um, kind of, you know, less connection um, within some uh, subnetwork. So happy to to share the paper but yeah great great talk again yeah please do share that paper thank you i wonder if um there'll be any differences found with the multi-echo data with some of the new sequences because those findings that sylvia was mentioning are from the 
kind of previously collected um, MRI sequences. So yeah, yeah it'd be interesting to compare. Sylvia, are you guys also um, collecting like ASL at all? Yeah, so actually, okay. so what we're doing right now is that, so, you know, kind of Nathan is doing a part of it and right. then we are just kind of, we're trying to scan the most participants, whatever Nathan is doing is what, what uh, right. Right. we're kind of doing, but yes, ASL, we have it. It's messy, right? I mean, that's another discussion. I'm from far, far from an expert, but uh, I, yeah, I would say not my expertise, really, really messy, so. I just have a more specific question about some of the methods already. Um, going back to when you're looking at the between network um, associations and mm -hmm. finding that in aging, the um, between network connectivity patterns that were negative kind of now become like uh, weakly positive. Um, so what was the reason, if, if that was where you were seeing the difference in those kind of negative to weak positive, well, was, am I right in interpreting that way? I was just going to say, what was the reason for then just choosing the strongest positive um, connections to, to focus in on? That's a really great question. So th these weren't quali um, like quantitatively. So we saw more, yeah. more of this pattern in older adulthood come out. So I guess this is subnetwork. So let me go to the main finding. Um, so we did see those come out as more, uh, more present in older adults. Um, this is true. Uh, the, the reasoning for looking at just the top 5% was really just to graphically illustrate it. There's no mm -hmm. real, a, a lot of what's done um, with like graph theory research when they plot these to look at how the networks sort of shift because a lot of them use global signal regression, they, they only look at positive correlations, yeah. right? But then they're also only looking at the strongest connections, A, because there are so many connections still. Um, and it, it's really just to visualize. We're not really quantifying anything at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and so we're already seeing at this point of the strongest connections that there's this clustering happening. But then- yeah we really want to quantify it by using like a partial least squares approach and looking at the pairwise differences here. I see. Okay. I wonder whether you could try visualizing it with just some of those like weaker connections where um, I'm not sure if that would be possible, but to see if there's yeah. more of a differentiation um, between networks perhaps. Yeah, definitely. That's actually been a discussion we've had a couple of times about is it just the strongest connections that are even of interest? Um, there is, you know, biological relevance to this increase of weak positive connections um, into older age. And so figuring out the best way to look at that is definitely on our radar. Yeah, good point. Any other questions? Maybe just a, um, a more general um, kind of point, um, whether Ronnie, you might be able to explicitly state what you believe are the advantages of all of these um, new methods that you've used and whether perhaps, um, you know, given that some of the findings are consistent with um, what's been found with using the more traditional techniques, you know, what you think your methods might add specifically um, in aging? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, first of all, I think multi-echo fMRI offers a huge boon in the, the ability to better approximate, you know, both sit, like get a sense of bold signal in each voxel. And so we're really increasing TSNR, but then also with the denoising. And I'd say like, that's the hugest benefit. Um, it's simplified and you're getting rid of a lot of motion in, in, a uh, way that's far more principled than traditional methods where, you know, the, I, I don't know how many papers now have been published on like how you pre-process the data really determines the results. And so here we're really honing in on bold signal for the most part, you know, there, there is still, you know, susceptibility related artifact and neurovascular coupling, maybe even respiration. Um, but already at that stage where we're really honing in on something closer to bold signal. So that's a huge, huge boon. Um, and then individualized parcellation, I think is also really important. And 
rather new because we know that functional regions change. And so now there are also a couple of papers coming out on, okay, what's the difference if we use different parcellation schemes, especially with different groups. And so again, if, if we're measuring functional connectivity from different regions, what are we actually measuring? And so with aging, I think these two together are super, super important. And then again, if you can maintain, keep the whole connectivity matrix rather than getting rid of half of it, we can really start to see what's happening in aging rather than ignoring half of the data. So I, I think that's the hugest benefit in studying aging. And so while you know a lot of this isn't you know novel and earth shattering findings, it, it's reassuring that we're still finding converging results, right? But now we're also really honing in on a regional connectivity, but also large scale patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, we have another question. Um, have you looked at whether there were any associations between age related atrophy and network mm -hmm. level alterations? I'm sure whether that's, you have that data. That's a good question. We have not, we don't have that data. Uh, but that is a good question. Yeah. What, so you would have had structural scans collected um, for these participants? We do have structural scans, yes. Um, I, so potentially we could look at, say, uh, you know, any sort of structural metric and see and see whether there are any correlations. Um, so, okay, we do have that data. We haven't looked at it, I should say. Yeah. Um, what would be your hypothesis about, would you think um, that some of these network changes might be driven by structural changes or do you think one might come before the other perhaps? Well, so I know at least when we were looking at the data, um, just sort of exploring it, um, there were whole brain volume relationships to um, bold dimensionality, but age is also related to bold dimensionality and whole brain volume is related to age. So yeah, I mean, um, I think atrophy is in part going to play a role uh, and that's sort of hard to disentangle from, you know, how functional connectivity reorganizes with age. Yeah, could be an interesting project perhaps for a future student to delve more into. Yeah, that too maybe beyond the scope of your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> um, Follow-up question for that one then. So would you say taking the node structural properties into account with network changes may help explain more variance in cognition? Can you say that one more time? So would you say taking the node structural properties into account with network changes may help mm. to explain more variance in cognition? So I guess it's a similar question, but specifically whether you think the relationships between the network changes and cognition um, might be related to atrophy as well. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Worth trying. Yeah. Yeah, definitely if you have the data. Um, and have you looked at, or are you planning on doing partial correlations? And mm. do you think that this could help to remove some of the noise, particularly the vascular noise? So it's something that we, um, in our lab, we've been kind of exploring a little bit more recently, um, looking at rather than just looking at all of the connect basically the connectivity matrix between um, all of the regions of the brain and taking all of the correlations, controlling each of those um, correlations for the rest of the correlations throughout the whole brain. So all of taking a connection and then controlling for all of the connections um, from the rest uh. of the brain as kind of a um, method of attempting to reduce some of the noise that, that might be present across the whole oh, brain. Interesting. Mm. We haven't tried that, no. Mm -hmm. um, also worth considering. I'd have to think a bit more about that, or maybe we can talk about that yeah, offline sure. as well. I'm interested yeah. to hear more. Yeah, sounds good. A few more minutes if there's any final questions. I mean, if there's a more question, I guess, would anyone have kind of, what's, what's, the, what's the feeling of people about partial correlation? 
<laughs> I, I mean, you know, I know that people like Gad and Varroco just preach for that, but the, I'm kind of always wondering if we're removing this, you know, we're trying to get the, the connection between everything, right? Like, and then are we kind of removing part of that to again, go at kind of more individual node? I mean, it's like, I have trouble uh, wrapping my mind. Malar, is it something that you're doing or Gabe or whoever, or? Um, I'm probably not the best person to speak to it in my lab, but either Gabe or Ray, we've been looking at it, um, but I wouldn't be able to say what we're specifically gaining or losing um, in the context of your question by using partial correlations. I don't know if Ray or, or Gabe Rosier, if you have any follow-ups. Sorry, uh, yeah, Ray or Gabe Rosier, yeah. I'm guessing no. We'll still be again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to bring back to another CIC discussion. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think it's a good idea to to try, if uh, if you can. It can help handle, you know, some of the, uh, I guess, like not true correlations that could come up if you were to do a, a plain old correlation. Another option is to do uh, um, something like a simple PCA on the data set first. And if you get a really strong first principle component that captures the majority of the variance, it suggests that you might be better off doing part of the correlation because there's a compound that's well, scaling the correlations. I mean, with all these things, right? I mean, as Ronnie mentioned in the beginning, you try many things without double dipping too many times and and, and, and then yeah. they don't give you the same result. And then you're like, okay, do I pick this one because this is what I want to see or is it kind of really the real result? So it's... Uh... I mean, it depends on what you think a result is, right? They're all results. Yeah, um, it's true, it's true. They're all, they're all results, but it's, it's a question of kind of trying to interpret the, the pathway that you chose. Yeah. And then we pick a journal with that allow like, uh, you know, 40 page of supplements and then at least we can show the process there. Well, that, that, that's the new challenge for publication, right? Is like, there's the paper, is the paper just an advertisement for the supplement material at this point? <laughs> exactly. I'm more and more feeling like it is, but anyways. Okay, well, thanks everyone for the great discussion um, and particularly to Ronnie for an uh, excellent, very comprehensive talk.